Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. The topic today is health equity, and I'm joined by two of my colleagues that are expert in this area. We have Samantha Fulton. Samantha is the Strategy and Development Manager for our Carrier Relations team. Hi, Samantha. Good morning, Tracy. And also, we have Vicki Walton, who is the Health Equity Leader for our Mercer Well team. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Tracy. So happy to have both of you here. You know, this is not an easy topic. It can be very overwhelming for employers. And I think on top of that, we know from our worker survey data from Inside Employees Minds that 68% of employees say that they have trouble getting the help that they need for themselves or a family member. And of course, at the top of the list is affordability, but a lot of the challenges that they're facing are actually associated with access to care, which brings us to this very important topic today. And so, Vicki, let's start with you. Will you share your thoughts on the complexities of health equity and DEI and, and how employers can address this area? Yes, Tracy, that is a common theme for many of our employers. We often hear how complex and broad health equity and DEI can be. And honestly, some simply just don't know where to start. And I agree, it is a complex and multifaceted issue that requires a holistic and comprehensive approach. The good thing is, according to our most recent survey, we found that 78% of employers are taking actions to address health equity. They are gaining a better understanding of what health equity really means through education and awareness. They're doing deep dives and assessments into the factors that can impact their employees' health and well-being. These include social determinants of health, workplace culture, and DEI initiatives. Most importantly, our health equity team at Mercer works with employers to help them be intentional and strategic and their approach to benefits. For so Vicki, that is really interesting. And that's a lot of good work that employers are doing. Clearly, the carriers are a big partner for them in this work. And so Samantha, can you just talk a little bit about what carriers are doing? What are they doing with their provider networks and their clinicians? Sure, absolutely. So for the last three years, Carrier Relations has conducted an RFI of all major medical, lab, and voluntary benefits carriers. In this RFI, we asked medical carriers if they were reviewing their networks to ensure diversity across their providers. And the good news is many have already done this or are planning to do so in the next year. The reality is, just like individuals have the option to self-identify and share demographic inf information, the same applies to physicians. So at a minimum, carriers know uh, we will know gender and language spoken from the carriers. Why is this important? This is important because of the follow-up question we asked, which was, how do you match and communicate unique providers to meet diverse membership needs? This brings us to the provider search tool. Carriers who are really being progressive in this space are pushing their providers to confirm their race, ethnic background, and I think, which is the easiest thing, provide a picture, but then they're going beyond to really push them to confirm their specialty areas and to note populations they have experienced serving, such as those with, um, with autism or, you know, if they have extensive training and working with um, LGBTQ plus related care or have experience with a certain addiction, whatever it is, the key is enhancing that provider search tool. You know, we want to empower members to, to find the right provider that matches their demographics or their specialty needs. I know we're talking about medical, but one thing I do want to point out is diversity of networks is not just a medical issue. Um, in the RFI, we saw that some voluntary carriers, on um, the legal carriers, are actually evaluating their attorney networks to ensure adequate representation across um, race and ethnicity as well. So it's great to see network diversity taken on so many forms right now with the carriers, but we still have a ways to go. Well, you know, it sounds like that the carriers are taking some great steps in this area. And Vicki, can you just talk about why is this important to employers for carriers to do this? Yes, Tracy, yes. I'm also very excited to see the great work that carriers and many other interested parties are taking to address health inequities, disparities, and access to care. It's imperative 
also that there's alignment between all parties to ensure that collectively we deliver measurable and sustainable solutions for our employees. And specifically, Tracy, when we talk about networks, I really want to touch on that when provider networks and clinicians who are diverse and culturally competent, they are better equipped to provide high quality care to patients from diverse backgrounds. Um, and why is this relevant? You know, because why do we, why is that important? Can they just go to anybody? Well, a recent study was conducted by JAMA Network Open. It is the first to link a high prevalence of Black doctors to longer life expectancy and lower mortality in Black populations. So this is life and death. And this also reinforced by further evidence that Black patients report higher satisfaction, are more comfortable, and trust providers who share their culture and value. And trust is a big deal in communities. And then we talk about those lived experiences, and that's what these providers can, can provide. And this can lead to better communication, more access and uh, to preventative care, and improved outcomes for, for uh, populations when they have those providers that look and talk and understand their needs. And Tracy, this transcends across all underserved populations. So I think that's super important. Um, we know from our research that about 40% of employers currently are focused on the network adequacy to meet the needs of their population, you know, specifically for everybody to be able to find a provider that looks like them to the extent that that's important to them and that helps them have that trust and it means that they're going to seek care, which is really a, a, a very important first step. Another thing that employers like to do, just speaking, you know, from my years of experience working with them, is that sometimes it's easier to focus on specific types of care. And so um, I was wondering if you might just take a minute and discuss what the data say regarding mental health care for individuals with diverse backgrounds. Yes, yes. So let's briefly discuss mental health. And I would be remiss not to mention that May is Mental Health Month. And um, what we've seen is a significant increase in mental health concerns within employee populations post-pandemic. It is probably one of the top three concerns for many employees. And we know mental health is a crucial aspect of overall health and well-being for everyone and their families but especially for diverse populations who are burdened with additional mental health challenges. Research shows that members of diverse populations, including racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus individuals, and individuals living with disabilities, often are faced with mental health challenges and disparities that include um, depression, anxiety, suicide at significantly higher rates. And then they also have difficulty accessing care. And so these challenges will impact employees' productivity, time off work. And so employers have to consider targeted interventions. And they can start by just normalizing the conversation around mental health and encourage the utilization of enriched benefits, such as EAP and therapeutics. And the data has shown that therapeutics for mental illness are disproportionately underused by certain populations. And so employers can work with diverse employees on solutions to find ways to destigmatize seeking treatment for mental health illness and support a comprehensive, affordable, quality access to in and outpatient care while removing barriers. Mental health and health equity should be a priority for employers. So that's a really good point. Um, and Samantha, you know, as you think about the carriers, what role do they play as it pertains to mental health? Is, and is this just a medical carrier issue or is it broader than that? You mentioned other carriers um, earlier when you were talking about health equity. Absolutely. Great questions, Tracy. So the role the carriers play is the role of connector. So many are increasing their partnerships with community-based organizations to ensure their case managers have the right resources to make the referrals. Um, we talked about um, the, the networks before. Their role is to actively ensure the behavioral health networks are just as diverse, just as robust as the physical health networks. We're actually seeing more carriers seek the NCQA health equity accreditation, which will help them address disparities in this space. 
um, on the LAD and VB side, the more progressive carriers are really looking at wellness from a holistic perspective. You know, they understand that financial wellness impacts behavioral health and wellness programs can help reduce absenteeism. Uh, these programs, the wellness programs can be integrated into a group health benefit solution for a more comprehensive experience to make it easier for the employee. Again, these aren't new insights, but the more effort that is put behind these programs, the more we will see a difference in this space. I, I could not agree more. And I think it's great that we're seeing that across all of the types of benefits. I think that it just ensures that we will move in the direction of better access and better outcomes. Um, so, Vicki, I want to switch gears. There's one more topic that I want to cover. We know from our employer research that 41% are really focused on providing um, equitable family building benefits. But I think within that category, there's a lot of focus on maternal health outcomes. And so can you tell us what employers can do to increase awareness of maternal health disparities and what kinds of things should they be doing and looking at through that lens of health equity and DEI? Yes, yes, Tracy, we're hearing a lot of news about the unprecedented poor health outcomes in maternal health in the U.S., and deservingly so. For example, 30% of maternal deaths are Black women. This has become a national crisis, and employers actually can play a significant role in providing solutions through the benefits. They can start by providing education and awareness campaigns about maternal health disparities to their employees. They can consider addressing the social determinants of health that impact maternal health outcomes and emphasize the importance of accessing quality maternal health care. And so let's look at the benefits more specifically. Employers can provide robust maternal health benefits to support their employees through pregnancy and childbirth. And we like to see this include alternative forms of birthing support, such as birthing centers, and consider coverage for doulas. You know, that's, that's incredibly important and nurse midwives. But when you look at it from the lens of DEI, you have to consider diverse options of doulas and nurse midwives. Um, they're looking at prenatal care, postnatal care, postpartum care, lactation support, and mental health services. And employers should consider expanding fl flexible work arrangements and extended parental leave to support employees who are pregnant and have given birth recently. And that often talked about employers must address structural barriers and other determinants that may prevent employees from accessing maternal health. So for example, what about transportation assistance to medical appointments, addressing some of the language barriers and working with healthcare providers to improve access to care for employees? And critically important, cannot go understated, is that employers can collect data on maternal health outcomes among their employees to better understand the disparities that exist and identify areas for improvement. And this can include tracking maternal health outcomes, access to care, and employee satisfaction with maternal health benefits to evaluate that employee journey and experience. And employers truly have a unique opportunity to leverage benefits to specifically target and support populations at risk from health challenges. Yeah, that is great. I think that um, both of you have provided such fabulous um, information and um, nuggets of advice in this. I think if we were to boil it down for employers um, just getting started or maybe still trying to navigate their path on this, um, we might break it down into, you know, first of all, kind of understanding what the problems and the opportunities are by looking at your own data. Um, you both talked about respecting the differences, providing um, very diverse access to providers um, across all of your benefit programs and making sure that people are aware of how to access those providers, providing coverages to meet diverse needs. We talked about mental health. We talked about maternal health. Those are both great opportunity areas. Of course, there are more beyond that. 
And um, lastly, you know, we do have employers that are committing to some really ambitious goals. Um, according to our research, 20% are um, working towards or they have already met the new corporate equity index standards. So there's a lot of good work going on and a lot of good tools to help and support employers on this journey. And I just want to thank you both for joining me today. But most importantly, thank you for all the good work that you've been doing.